Alrighty, what do we got here? Ah, it's you guys again. <laughs> Alright. <clears throat> I got the sniffles. <clears throat> Hopefully this won't last. <clears throat> Hope you can hear me. I know the sound quality is poor. When I get back to New Hampshire, New Hampshire. Oh, so grab my camera. Yeah. I'll set the good camera up with the good mic and all that stuff. It's October 4th, 2023. It's 118 Vegas time. Actually, I may be in Arizona now. I think I'm still in Vegas on my way to Arizona based on my surroundings. And I was just on the, the X, formerly the artist formerly known as Twitters. And I know there's a lot of bots on there, okay? I know there's a lot of AI. I know there's a lot of foreigners that are just cutting and pasting what I say into ChatGPT, having it translate, having it make a response, posting it back, and, and whatever. So, that aside, there's some accounts that have a decent number of followers. I mean, relative, you know, thousand, thousand followers or more. And just think about if you were out in the world and you showed up to some place where there's a thousand people and you were talking to them. So even if those are a lot of bots, let's say half of them are bots and stuff, you show up and you're talking to 500 people. It's still a lot of people. So I'm <clears throat> just interacting and just very things that I, I forget that I didn't always know that now have become second nature to me and very simple. I forget that the masses uh, still don't understand and even see that or even come close or want to see it. They'll fight you tooth and nail to hold on to it. They want to eat that steak inside the matrix. If it looks like steak and it tastes like steak, then it must be steak. They're all a bunch of scientists. So just to give you an example, I was talking about the amount of propagandized egalitarianism in the world and how so many people still have an egalitarian mindset. And it's pushed so hardcore. You're not allowed to talk about the differences between IQ or races, or that races even exist, or that there's differences between ethnicities. You're only allowed to talk about the differences between voting blocks. So there's no such thing as a Hispanic. That's an voting term. Blacks and whites, there's not really such thing either. That's just two skin colors based on where you evolved, uh, either close to the equator or you know, away from the equator with the exception of albinos and stuff. Sure, you could have, you know, two black parents move to the to one of the poles and have a baby, and the baby's obviously gonna come out black, not white. So it's not an adaptation per se. Tanning tanning's the adaptation. Melatonin in skin color is the evolutionary trait. And to be an albino is uh, a scientific mutation. The fact that I even have to pre-label it with scientific because if you say mutation, people put a negative connotation on it. When it should just be neutral, it's a science word. But you're not allowed to use science words either. You're not allowed to use racism, which is a science, sexism, which is a science. Um, you're not allowed to say the word retardation or retard, which is just, you know, uh, science terms they've been turned into negative hate speech connotation by fields and within the so social realm I guess people can see that but like <clears throat> back to the double standard in order for there to be a double standard then you have to have two identical starting points and then 
those two identical starting points philosophically are treated in two different ways. So when people make statements such as like there's a double standard between men and women with X, X being whatever, fill in the blank, not, not the, the, the content creator formerly known as Twitter, but fill in, fill in the blank, X. Um, and so they get a little confused when they say, when there's a double standard, for instance, in the court system during divorce with men and women, or when women get, uh, you know, sentenced to jail, there's a double standard. And I want to explain what's going on here and why there's so much confusion. And then hopefully, if you can extrapolate data, you can take this example and fill in the, the different parts. I'm going to teach you A plus B equals C. And then you can always fill in with new data and extrapolate outwards when you're trying to use this principle. So first of all, start off with something that I've said on here time and time again, I'll continue to say, laws cannot be created, they already exist. They can be discovered, and there are physical laws, and there's moral laws. And people, or the government, and many people get confused because the government says we're creating a new law. Impossible! But it's literally impossible. The laws are, uh, you know, science, philosophy, mathematics. They're woven into the fabric of the universe and they already exist. So rulers can create rules. So what they're talking about is they're trying to create these societal rules, pretend that they're gods, and they're creating more laws in the universe. So there's a law of gravity. And, but there's no, you know, law that says all men are created equal by their, by their whatever. So they write that on a piece of paper, but it's, we're not all created equal. I'm not even equal to myself yesterday. I have changed. Now, I am created equal by law, meaning I can't avoid gravity, and neither can anybody else. So we're bound to the consequences of law naturally. But if I jump out of a 10th story window, without a parachute, and somebody else jumps out of a 10-story window with a parachute. We're both tr being treated equal by the law of gravity as to where the person with the parachute is understanding that you can counterbalance that with friction to go against it, and you can slow down your rate of speed from 9.8 meters per second square falling towards the planet to injure yourself. But we're both being pulled by gravity and can't avoid that. But we can act in a particular way that is different individual within those laws. So take the court system, for example, where people are saying, oh, well, they treat women differently than men under the law. So let me just dissect this and bring it back. So you're using actual terms and words. Yes, men and women are treated the same under laws. If a man and a woman both jump out of a 10th story window with no parachute, they're both gonna fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. And if the woman's fat and heavy, there may be more friction. I'm not sure exactly how it is. They're going to fall at the same speed minus the friction. In a vacuum, they'll fall at the same speed. But within the court system, you're actually going with rules versus rulers. 
and the law is still affecting them equally, but the rules are affecting them differently. And there's a biological law where, for the most part, in general, most DNA strands of men are going to be more sympathetic to females than they are to males. They, they can bypass their prefrontal cortex and make other decisions, but they're trying to create consequences for rules that they created within a society and balanced, but they're trying to create them while having a biological difference. So you can't, so everybody ha has a built-in bias, including myself, based on your genetics history and stuff. And it's very difficult to overcome most, if not all, biological, completely overcome all biological understandings and instinctual things to the point where People that probably completely ignore them or could or had the ability to on some strange geotheopathical intelligence game theory play in their mind wouldn't probably be able to create more life and the DNA strain would disappear. So when you look at a man and a woman getting sentenced for the same crime, as they call it, it's actually a rule. And most of the time it wasn't the same. You know, like if there's a woman and a man murdering somebody, a lot of times it, it wasn't done the same. One was done maybe with poison and one was done violently, so they were suffering. One was done like maybe it was a random act. Um, and maybe one was methodical and they thought that it was because of abuse and then you say well it doesn't matter if you're being abused go to the authority but then you're assuming that the individual that did that is intelligent enough to do that and yeah sure you can get mad at me but IQ wise for the most part most females on average have a lower IQ than a male now most males that go to jail have a lower IQ than the national population and so on and so forth so most women that create crimes also have lower IQs than the average of women, and women have lower IQs. For instance, the average single mother, last I checked, had an IQ of about 90, which is about one deviation, 10 points under the national average for uh, the IQ of a white population or a white woman. Anywho, so when you're looking at two things, you, you it's not like you're comparing apples and apples and you're saying, well, I have two apples here and they're getting different treatment. You have an apple and an orange that did two different things that are getting two different treatments and the other factor, the judge or the judicial system or the jury that looks at that are also another factor who have biological urges that are looking in and making decisions and bias based on not only their past traumas, but intergenerational DNA strategies that have helped life forms to exist and move forward. To both, to both ways. So they might be harsher on violent men because they were more dangerous to society over time. And they might be lighter on women uh, over time because being lighter on women didn't affect society as much, and that could be ingrained in certain DNA patterns. But the point of the matter is, you can break it all the way down to the individual, and even within the individual, most individuals that are growing in some manner aren't the same year to year, month to month, week to week, day to day, or even hour to hour of how they're interacting with the world. So to, to, to boil everything down and believe that we're all these gelatinous creatures that are surrounded by society exactly the same, even though we've had 
hundreds of thousands of years of evolution in different directions, from different cultures, different stressors, different climate change, weather patterns, uh, heat temperatures, cold temperatures, uh, food availability, types of food, such as people that were fishing and growing large brains with higher IQs and quicker intelligence to live near the Mediterranean, versus people that were, were in, or people that are living at fat that um, in cold, cold climates that are bigger and fatter uh, and hold more fat cells, yet don't seem to be any unhealthier, or people that are super skinny that live in hot, heated climates that don't seem to be as unhealthy as somebody who lives in a uh, less hot atmosphere that gets that, that gets that skinny. Because one is a baseline genetically for the evolutionary pattern and the other one is an offset of that that's happened based on choices and consequences that they've made along the way. So, here come, here, here's some philosophy for you. Know thyself. I want you to think, I want you to stop here for a second. This is going to help you in your relationships on a personal level, romantic level, business level, uh, society level, uh, your local level, your government level, when you're interpreting data. The, the want and the yearn to project who you are into the shell of another person or, I'm vegan, I see this a lot in the vegan community, people want to anthropomorphize animals, they'll project human characteristics of themselves into animals and creatures, as if they're looking into a mirror. Understand that you, and, and, and believe this, and understand it, and love this about yourself, and know thyself as an individual, you are an amazing individual with different skill sets, different strengths, different weaknesses. And to learn your strengths and to lean into your strengths, you'll start to be more successful in those areas. And instead of working on your weaknesses, understand your weaknesses and then find individuals to either complement your weaknesses or in a business setting you could delegate your weaknesses to another party for instance as much as i like art and i'm creative in art uh, i have more of a logic structured systematic thing so for to me the amount of time that it would take me to do something creative it's <coughs> excuse me makes more sense for me to delegate the time and energy into the creative endeavors of my business for somebody who's creative to manage while I manage more of the structural, logical, mathematical aspects of the nature. Also, my creativity is more verbal like this. So, um, I would say that I'm talkative and actually one of the um, affirmations that uh, I guess I would call it an affirmation or understanding or one of my strengths that I have on a strength list that I read uh, just to like verbalize this and see it and let it sink in is I just I have, you know you're talkative and that's a strength and I have another line that says stay away from people that don't appreciate your strengths so when I was younger, I hung out with a couple of people that would get upset that I was talkative or say I can't get a word in edgewise. And I'm not a good match for them because when I do meet people that get along with me, I talk, they talk, they know how to jump in, jump back, say, hey, hold on, oh, before I forget, and they add in. And you're going back and forth at a high energy level with high functioning brain that can weave in and out of these topics. And so you can have a conversation with somebody, bam, 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 bam. And then I'll, I might interrupt and go bam, 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 bam. And then say to them, you were saying ba, 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 and bring them back to where they ended. We'll hop back in the conversation. 
we'll go forward from there with the new information that's here. And it's a dance and it's a move back. It's a step forward. And you're working together to create a talk. When I, I've noticed when people are waiting to talk instead of having a conversation with you back and forth and you're both interacting together, they'll say to me, oh, you're too talkative. And it says, well, that means, so you're not listening and having a conversation. You're not dancing with me in this talk. You are waiting to say something else, which is fine, but I'm not waiting to say something else. I'm trying to converse with you. So I'm talking, hoping that you're gonna jump in and talk back and forth and we're gonna rumble and dance and have fun, you know? I always imagine those people off topic to be lousy in bed. You know, those are the people like, I'm a quick, excuse me, okay, I oh, is this feeling good on your neck? Okay, it is good, all right. Do you like your vagina licked? You do, okay, excellent, excellent. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be right back. I'm going down, down to your vagina. It's like, just fucking do it, dance, listen to the thing, jump in, jump out, spin around. If it's not working, change it up. And so once I just embraced that, I like language, I like talking, I like communicating. I try to get to myself to a point where I'm uh, communicating and saying things. And sometimes people get offended, or sometimes people say, like, why did you say that to me? And I notice a lot of times they're saying, why do you say that to me? It's when I'm setting up a boundary. And I know that's a little bit off topic right now, but the point is I have a very individual independent train of talkativeness that's something that I'm good at or I feel that I'm good at and not everybody has that so if I look if I act egalitarianism if I act like an egalitarianist expecting that everybody is going to be a thing then we're not going to match and we're not going to have a good conversation so I also can pull it back so if I recognize that somebody is not good with conversation, I will pull that interaction back, small talk with them, and pretty much walk away, get out of it. Because I cannot have people in my life that aren't good storytellers, that don't like that fun, that can't talk, um, and they can't jump in back and forth. It's, it's you know, it's, it's amazing and it's exciting when you feel the energy back and forth. Like I said, I... I, I I relate it to good, good, positive, flowing sex with an individual that feels confident in, in who they are and in the moment can share and set up boundaries similar to a conversation where you express something, something you need, something you don't need during the conversation or right in the middle of sex. You can, you know, you can, without you can even do it without words during sex but you can stop something from happening or add something that's happening that you would prefer and teach or remove and it's just a dance it'd be so different than on a dance floor you don't have to tell each other where you're moving your your feet and your hips and your shoulders when you're gonna grab and you're spinning you're just there in the moment and you're getting a vibe and a feeling from the person so you want to take that back to your strengths or your weaknesses and realize that you're an individual as you know your, thyself. Realize that people around you have their own traits and differences and perspectives and traumas and understanding. And realize that when they're making decisions as, as neutral as they're trying to be, trying to sit in that gray neutral. There's a biological element to everybody and an experience element to everybody that makes it impossible for egalitarianism to exist. So why is there such a huge push for egalitarianism? Well, if you can convince everybody to be working towards a common impossible goal and that the answer is just more power and more resources to move towards that in that that goal. Then you constantly have an imaginary goal and a goalpost that you can move towards because you'll never ever get there. So it's just gonna, you know, it's like 
the idea of the singularity, the idea of we're all the same, the idea of we can get equality, the idea of we can just balance the scale perfectly, the idea of th there's, there's, there's two egalitarian, ma two main things. Obviously, everybody's an individual with different ideas and different strategies and stuff that thinks independently. Two main movements within the egalitarian movement. One is that they recognize that everybody is different. And so they think that the laws, which are actually rules, but the government rules created by the rulers, should be twisted and turned just a little bit in the favor of everybody and handed out specifically to that individual so that the outcome is the same and the rules are changed ever so slightly so that the outcomes are balanced on the other side. But they recognize that the individuals are different. The other type of egalitarianism is the type where they don't, where they try to convince you that, even though the reality time and time again supports the opposite, that everybody is the same and that some people have these different biases and only because of the biases do people look different. So you have to treat everybody the exactly the same and as you treat them the same, they'll start acting and being the same. But you cannot change the science. You know what I mean? If you, if I have a parachute on and I jump out the 10 story window and you don't have a parachute on and you jump out the 10th floor, all the belief in the world that we're the same is not gonna change the outcome of that situation. I don't care how many times you've watched The Matrix, you're not gonna land on the pavement and smash, smash it down with your feet and put your fist into the ground and, and, and survive. There's a reality to the situation. But remember, in the meantime, yes, the actual laws of the universe will stay the same. You'll still fall at 9.8 meters per second squared minus any friction rates that are, that are slowing you down from that speed, but the, the, the underlying, the fabric laws are same. Um, how do I wrap this up, I guess, is where we're at. Where, we're, where, where, we, where are we at here? We're at 27 minutes. We're looking at some beautiful mountains here. I'm definitely getting closer to Arizona if I haven't already missed Arizona, welcome to Arizona sign. But go back. So we're going to go back about eight minutes this video, I guess, in my mind, where I said, make a list, get an idea, know thyself. There's a pretty good book. It's called Clifton's Book of Strength, I think. Basically, you buy the book, and the book has a test with it. You can take the test, and it gives you a list of your strengths. And it's been going on for a long time. So as they collected more and more data, they get more and more specific with what your strengths are. And when you're done with the book, you should have an idea of what your strengths are. And then you can kind of go through, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the opposite of those are your weaknesses. But you could then go through there and see what the opposites are and see what relates to you as your weaknesses. But if you can find your strengths and you can lead into your strengths, the book will give you an idea of what complements those strengths. Uh, so you can start making friends, business relationships, and, and personal relationships, romantic relationships with people that complement your strengths. And it's not an exact science because it doesn't mean just because you're talkative, for instance, that you want somebody that's a good listener. If you're talkative, you might also want somebody that's also talkative so that you guys can jump in and have that talk dance. But another one for me was a visionary. So if you're somebody that's always constantly looking to the future, and try to plan, organize, innovate, you might be better off with somebody that's calm, passive, and in the moment, so the two of you complement uh, one another. One keeps you grounded in the moment, and you keep pulling them forward to success and change, and you can grow together. 
But whatever those strengths are, you figure out what your strengths are. You figure out your comp, whatever is complimentary to you. And you don't have to buy the book. You can just sit down and write some notes and figure it out on your, by yourself. And then look around at some major factors in your life. I would start with negative things that are affecting you. Whether it's emotions, families, friends, events. Um, <coughs> concrete or conceptual. So like if you feel like you don't have any physical money, then maybe you want to look around at your job, your business, your title, the school, the employment, and say, oh wait, like, am I, you know, somebody who's bad at numbers, that's creative and, and but not logical, and I'm trying to be an, uh, an accountant in an all male, you know, account firm, so maybe you've, already, you've set yourself up for disaster if you're a female in that situation, and maybe you should be in a creative endeavor or in a female office or in, in a different business altogether, but you have sold this tale of egalitarianism, and now you're working you know, 10 times as hard as your counterparts. Now you can continue to do that if you want, that's your choice. If you want to, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where you're trying to pretend that you're equal to your to your peers in your particular situation and you want to keep doing that you can but I'll tell you what's probably gonna end up happening is you're gonna stress yourself out being something that you're not you're going to be emotionally stressed mentally stressed physically stressed and every hour that you spend doing something that you're not good at, that you're not focused at, that doesn't involve your strengths, is an hour that you're not working in a career where you could be excelling, learning, getting more skills, and utilizing the strength that you have. So if you're heading, if you have a GPS set up and you're heading to point from point A to point B, and you figure out that you're going in the wrong direction, you don't want to keep continuing in the wrong direction until you feel like turning around. You want to immediately turn around to get your, to your de destination. So after you have these lists, like I said, if you're a visual learner, you can maybe make uh, cut some pictures out online and make a vision board for yourself. If, you're, if you like to write or read, I would write them down and read them every morning and change them around, or you can do both. You can put a vision board, write it down, read it, put it on there, read it visually in the morning. If you're, you can make a video and talk to yourself and watch yourself and be empathetic for your future self. So you write this stuff down just for you. I mean, make a video just for you like this and then watch it and talk to yourself in the future. If you're an audio listener, you can record it into a device and listen back to it. Whatever it takes for you to figure it out, change, understand, and believe. And the last step would be to continue to work on the stuff in your life that you're viewing through a lens of, you know, egalitarian and was everybody's exactly the same and similar. Look at it through an individual lens, who's different, all this stuff. And then when you recognize that, just keep doing it over and over again. Keep using that strategy. And then diversity actually will become your strength on an individual level when it's organic, spontaneous, and voluntary, not when it's, you know, planned, uh, centralized, and enforced. Organic, spontaneous, and voluntary interactions with diversity. You can form a diverse group of individuals, coworkers, relationships, romantic, personal, however you want to set them up, where your strengths are being utilized and then you're hanging out with people that you can delegate the strengths that you're not good at with. Oh, welcome to Utah. Looks like I'm on my way to Salt Lake City. I just left Arizona, I suppose. Maybe it was Vegas. Maybe it was uh, Nevada, I mean. But I'm in uh, <coughs> Utah, Salt Lake City. Pretty soon. Beautiful. All right, that's enough rambling. 34 minutes should be enough to get you to get your juices flowing. But points to walk away from here: one, 
laws are woven into the fabric of the universe. They cannot be broken or created. They must be obeyed or you will face natural consequences. Mostly negative, but they're good because they'll get you back on track, back on target so you're not sinning. A sin is when you miss the target. Rules are created by rulers. Rules must be disobeyed. If rulers keep creating rules and you obey them, then you'll fall off track from following natural order. And people will start believing that those rules are laws. So rulers make rules and rules must be disobeyed. Laws exist already. They cannot be created nor destroyed. It must be obeyed or natural consequences were occur. People are individuals. All life forms are individuals. They should be treated as such, so be careful not to take what you are and astral project yourself into other living, living creatures and pretend that you're looking at two similar things. And even when you have a universal law, Remember that there's other factors within that law that can adjust that that law acts or reacts the same to two people that are individuals experiencing that. The, the, the example that I used was the parachute and no parachute and the law of gravity. But you have to, you don't have to do anything. I would suggest that you learn how to extrapolate that outwards get better and better at it and then get more nuanced with it and so you can see it in more of a micro micro way between interactions uh, in your day-to-day -day life so you start using those tools and strategies I, 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 I guarantee that you'll start to see improvements in your life you'll start to feel better healthier more confident your self-esteem fuel will be filled up you'll start gathering resources of self-esteem you start seeing the world in a better place, be, making better moves, gathering more resources and less time, better friends, more enjoyment, more love. You might have to go through a negative part first. Depending how far away you are from the truth, it can hurt to get back to it. When you've been away from reality for so long, there might be a lot of not natural consequences that you have to uh, work through that are, that are negative and painful. But on the other side of that shit tunnel, like in Shawshank Redemption that Andy crawled through, you can be on a beautiful beach with the ones you love. 